We face a huge challenge in attracting the next generation of talented new recruits. Traditionally, construction has not very, been very good at selling itself and attitudes and stereotypes are, uh, are discouraging large uh, sections of the population. Which is why we're here today. We're here to discuss how to attract the best and the brightest from a diverse range of backgrounds. So my colleague Chris is an incorporated engineer um, with the Institution of Civil Engineers. He, has, he now works for Morgan Sindel in the construction and infrastructure division, primarily in tunneling and the water sector. He's now working on Thames Tideway West section, having previously spent the last four and a half years developing um, the 80 meter shaft at the Lee Tunnel site. Civil engineering wasn't my first choice. Uh, I initially looked at electrical installation and aeronautical engineering. Um, when I first heard about civil engineering from my dad, uh, I have to say I thought it sounded extremely boring. Um, a degree in civil engineering and a master's in engineering project management and I'm now six years into a, a really exciting career. Sakthi is a chartered civil engineer uh, working in design consultancy uh, and uh, contracting primarily in the UK, Spain and Peru. She is currently undertaking a PhD at the University of Cambridge in bridge infrastructure, in monitoring of bridge infrastructure and has recently been named on the Forbes list of 30 under 30 rising stars in Europe to watch for in the industry category. So for me, civil engineering was never a career that was presented at school. The only reason I'd even heard of it was because my father is a civil engineer working in the water sector and my uncle was a professor in mechanical engineering. And that's how I got into it. I um, went down the traditional route, going to university, um, where my fees were paid for by the Institution of Civil Engineers and Industry. So we're both part of the uh, Institution of Civil Engineers Inspirations Panel, uh, working to inspire the next generation uh, of civil engineers. But this isn't as easy as, uh, as it seems. So let's look at some facts. We as the engineering industry um, do not have a diverse range of people. And I want to know what you, the audience, think of some of these facts that we're going to present. So first of all, if our population is growing more generally, what do you think about our pool of talent, our sort of level of 18 year olds. Do you think that's increasing, staying the same, decreasing? The increase in population doesn't correlate with the number of 18 year olds. We actually have a forecast for a decrease in 18 year olds in the next few years. It'll later pick up, but it means that our pool of talent and the people that we're trying to attract is getting smaller and smaller. This in relation to our skills demand poses a big problem. If we need all these people in the construction and engineering sectors, within civils itself, we need another 5,000 people, according to the, skills, uh, the Construction Skills Network, for the next four years, up until the end of the decade. This means that we need 1,720 civil engineers. This growth is driven by projects such as new nuclear, um, the water industry, big projects like Chris's Thames Tideway, and also in big rail projects like Crossrail and High Speed 2. All these projects will drive year-on-year -year growth of 6.1%. So 51% uh, of the population are female. Uh, what proportion of the industry do you think are female? 20? What do you think? Only 14.1% of construction professionals are women, uh, and only 8.2% of engineering professionals are women which is appalling when you consider almost half of the UK wor workforce uh, these days is female. The lack of women within our industry isn't uh, just a, women, a, a problem for females. Uh, this is an issue that we all need to address at all levels. It starts right from preschool uh, all the way through middle school where we address, uh, address the, the lack of uh, women taking up STEM subjects such as physics. Um, and are we telling them that our industry is just for boys? Well, like I said at the beginning, when I was at school, I did maths and sciences at, at uh, A-level, and neither my school teachers nor my career advisors suggested that it would be a suitable career. School, and actually my parents for that matter, suggested medicine as a fulfilling career for someone studying maths and sciences. So are we doing enough to retain female graduates once they get through uni uh, and into the workplace? And what are we doing to ensure they have a, a, an equal playing field uh, when advertising jobs? Are they suppo supported through uh, before and through maternity leave uh, and when they get back into work? Uh, and are they treated respectfully and, and provided with equal opportunities? 
So just as a quick story, in the last few years, I've become a chartered civil engineer, and I've been working in industry. And I have a number of stories, one of which goes like this. So I sat down with a colleague who was about five years older than me, and I raised a few concerns, primarily the fact that I was being given roles that kind of fall, fell more under a secretarial role than a, than a civil engineer's role. I was writing up minutes, I was summarizing information for him to take forward, this, that, and the other. And I thought I'd just sit down with my colleague and kind of point out that maybe I should be given a few opportunities to try something new, or why don't you let me take a bit more responsibility on? On having this conversation with my colleague, he looks at me and he goes, exactly, I think you're just being a bit too sensitive about this. And I thought that was an outrageous thing to say. One, for like purely dismissing my kind of question and query on the subject. I mean, some people do have to do the kind of legwork, but you should also be provided with some opportunities to grow. Secondly, use of language, too sensitive, is not the kind of language a woman wants to hear in the workplace. And I thought it was quite an inappropriate thing to say. And I've got many, many stories like that. So if we're having, having issues like that in the workplace, how are we meant to promote this to the next generation of females to enter and put up with this level of, of well, I don't even know how to describe it. <laughs> If 14% of the population comes from a black or ethnic minority background, what proportion do you think we have in our industry? It's not as bad as uh, the last statistic. 6% in engineering and 11% of the professional construction workforce. And obviously that varies slightly. Um, obviously London has a slightly different skew than, say, Sheffield, but it's an average figure. So AFBE UK, which is an association um, created to promote engineering to black and minority ethnic groups, um, does a lot of work in schools and also does surveys within schools. And they've noted a few observations, that the motivations, perceptions, and decisions undertaken by young people fall into three main categories. One of those is family environment. Second one is the amount of uh, enthusiasm their teachers have. And thirdly, it relates to their role models. So for example, in one of the schools they went to in Southwark, they found out that of the students who were interested in engineering to study after they leave school, 71% of those people had either a mother, brother, a sister, or father who was already a civil engineer. Another interesting stat was that when they went to a school in Hackney, the young people seemed particularly interested in speaking to engineers who came from the same ethnic background, particularly if they were from the same local area within London. This kind of just highlights that young people need a few more role models and figures that look a little bit like them, someone they can relate to and someone they imagine themselves as being in the future. So. How many lesbian, gay, bisexual and transsexual engineers are open about their sexual orientation at work? A study by uh, NC and Architects uh, Journal, Construction News, revealed that more than 60% of gay men and women engineers have heard homophobic comments in the workplace in the last 12 months, with one in five experiencing offensive behavior directly. Meanwhile, less than half of all gay engineers feel comfortable in being open about their sexual orientation with their immediate colleagues, um, a figure which falls to just 8% when uh, visiting construction sites. Half of those surveyed uh, uh, have heard the word gay used as an insult. So, are there other diversity characteristics? We've talked about females, ethnicity, sexual orientation. What other characteristics do you think of in a diverse force? Age, yeah, it's a good one. Disabled, yeah, it's a good one. One more. <laughs> There's a surprisingly wide range of characteristics that makes a diverse workforce. If we're saying we're struggling with diversity, it's not just in the obvious. I think we talk a lot about women in engineering, which is, of course, a problem, but there's a number of other characteristics we need to think about. Social class, disability, religion, carers, and how we facilitate them taking a more active role in the construction industry. So whose problem is this? Who do we have to blame? Why are we in this mess now? We've got two problems. One is the pure numbers game. If we're currently looking at people who reflect our current diversity profile in the industry, we're kind of discouraging a significant number of people that we can't afford to lose. We went through the numbers game and we realized that we just don't have enough people to pull from. Then secondly, we as civil engineers are expected to address some of the world's greatest problems. But how can we address these problems if we're only predominantly from one demographic? We need different types of people to solve these problems. So whose fault is this? Why are, we, why are we in this state of play? I, for one, I'd say teachers were one. 
ourselves. Ourselves, yeah. Yep. Which must include parents. Complacency. Government, government's definitely one. Media, I'd say media has a lot to play. How often do you see your engineering as a uh, really exciting, diverse career? I don't, I don't think so. I think I mostly see people in hard hats and that's about it. So these are the kind of things we came up with. You, the media, teachers, our prof the Institution of Civil Engineers needs to work on it, the government, the industry, parents, us. We as individuals have a huge responsibility. So the question we need to ask ourselves is why should the next generation inherit these problems? Um, how do the next generation even know these problems exist? Uh, it's often said that the built environment contributes to 50% of all greenhouse gases uh, emissions. Uh, and how do we get young people excited about uh, tackling these challenges? Uh, surely this is a, these are challenges that civil engineers can help deal with. And how do we, f uh, do we fully understand the challenges uh, the world is facing ourselves? So if we take a look at the current state of affairs within the UK and globally, the world's kind of changing, and it's changing at faster and faster rates. So when the Institution of Civil Engineers was first established, and that was nearly 200 years ago, the world population had just surpassed 1 billion for the first time. Flash forward to now, we're at about seven times that number. And by 2050, it's predicted to be about 10 billion people on this planet. A society where pre predominantly more urban. So around the 1900s, only 13% of people lived in urban centers. Now we're at about 50%, and by about 2050, um, the predictions kind of say something like 70% of people will live in urban centers. So large numbers of people moving into urban centers will affect infrastructure, resource demand, societal behavior, and throw up a whole number of challenges that we as civil engineers in the construction industry have to face. Considering technological challenges, if you look at um, technology, it's kind of been exponential in nature as time goes by. So the co-founder of Intel was a man called Gordon E. Moore, and he coined the term uh, Moore's Law, which says that it's an observation over history that approximately every two years, the number of transistors on a dense integrated circuit doubles. So it kind of means that uh, digital technology is increasing. It, it, it is increasing exponentially. I think we kind of see that. There's a lot of buzzwords about the fourth revolution and the tech revolution and all this kind of stuff, and it's something that we as engineers need to consider. So we're facing a lot of new challenges, but then we're also facing a lot of big opportunities. Say with the tech revolution, there's a real opportunity to encourage this to young people. We have to consider also not just what we have to sell, but how young people themselves are behaving, because I think that's also changing year on year. The importance of young people having a fulfill, fill, fulfilling career is also changing. People are more likely to switch careers uh, and expect uh, more flexible working. Young people behave differently, they, they demand more job satisfaction, uh, and they want to feel uh, like they're working towards something to make a difference. And they so, certainly don't feel tied to a job. Young pe people are likely to form startups, which is something uh, if we don't like something, and we innovate and develop our own solutions. People are increasingly uh, looking to make a difference societally and environmentally, uh, as our awareness of the importance of these issues increases. And this is evident when looking at the next generation of engineering talent. Numbers in popularity and course intake have shifted from civil engineering in recent times um, to chemical process uh, and, engineering, uh, and energy engineering. Me mechanical engineering also uh, continues to rise at a much higher rate than civil engineering. Our profession needs to understand how we are competing with the other uh, industries uh, for our share of the skills in the next generation. Uh, the figures we gave you earlier suggest, uh, uh, back this up, um, we're failing to achieve this. So what are we doing? So we're part of the inspiration panel, um, which we volunteer for, for the in Institution of Civil Engineers. And there's kind of three main aims of this group. So one of them is a 16 to 18 plan, considering that sort of step from school into the workplace. So one, we want to shape how young people hear about the, the civil engineering program through school, but also understand what skills the education sector need to provide our young people to help equip them for careers in construction and civil engineering. So we're trying to change the misconceptions surrounding our profession, that it's not just a, a dirty industry uh, full of men working out in the field with, uh, with the mud and bricks. Um, it's, there is a diverse range and we, we continue to build on this diverse range. We also continue to inform uh, through education and training. Uh, government advisory groups and through supporting organizations such as STEMnet and uh, Engineering UK's Big Bang Fair. 
uh, who exists to connect industry to young people in a fun and accessible way. So then we'd just like to talk to you about a few kind of ideas and thoughts and get your opinion. So we talked earlier about the tech revolution and BIM for our industry is relatively new on the whole scale of things, but it's pretty well embedded and people understand that. What we want to do is think about a little bit further what next revolutions are coming up and how we can attract young people with that. For example, I was doing a course uh, with a group in Croydon and we were teaching them various different design skills, construction skills, but the thing they picked up super quickly was this idea of um, 3D modeling. Within a couple of hours, they'd managed to knock something up and take measurements and animate a whole thing. I think the fact that they pick up technology a lot faster has some real opportunities for our industry to take from that, um, to learn from. Another example of kind of young people and their interaction with tech is, um, so I have one of these little Google Cardboard devices. I don't know if you've seen them, but you put them in a box and you put your phone in and you look at it and it kind of simulates virtual reality. And it costs pennies because it just uses an app on your phone and a little bit of cardboard. But I gave this to my uncle and I had to st stand there and explain it to him and you know, show him how to use it. I gave it to my cousin. So his son's like two, three years old. The kid picks it up and just knows what to do with it. Then he takes it out and swipes left, right with my phone. They just seem to pick these things up. So if we have opportunities like that, what can we do to make the most of that? And how do we encourage the next generation? From our point of view now, I mean, we, we, we wanted to open up the floor and see if anyone got any more, uh, any radical ideas for uh, addressing skill shortages, misconception uh, of how the uh, construction industry looks. I mean, how, how do you guys think? Uh, I, I guess there's, is there any engineers here? Is there anyone that's, that's not construction? How do you feel like construction industry looks? Do you think it's a muddy, dirty place? Or is it uh, innovative? Is it uh, intelligent? I'm not an engineer, but do you think the um, sort of the drop off in apprenticeships has massively hampered the engineering construction industry in terms of you know so many people go to university now, and you know, I've, I've had friends that have done civil engineering degrees, and they've just been poached by KPMG and PwC. So it's not even just an engineering a problem within the engineering sector. So do you think perhaps almost, I know there is talk within the media and within the government of reverting back to increasing apprentices and apprenticeships, and do you think perhaps targeting young people or get, getting them in at you know, 16, 17, 18 and um, almost supporting them potentially through a university, any, any um, qualification, if that's potentially one of the routes back to uh, getting them while they're young, so to speak? Yeah, actually, it's a perfectly timed statement, as next week is actually National Apprenticeship Week. Um, and I think that when I started my career, I didn't even think about an apprenticeship because it didn't seem that obvious, whereas I think now there's some real opportunities. Because previously, I don't know what the kind of misconception is, but kind of looking at where people are now, if you take an apprenticeship, not only do you get a degree, you learn part-time, but you're also paid on your job. It, it almost sounds like a no-brainer. Why wouldn't you take up that opportunity? No student loan. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I actually had a look at doing an apprenticeship uh, before I started university, uh, and uh, I got a place at college. And before I went to college, the, uh, the job, the work site I was supposed to go on uh, started laying apprenticeship, apprentices off, and then I was out of, uh, out of an apprenticeship for a, a year. And this is when I took up the more vocational route. I, I decided I need to, needed to manage this myself. And, and I totally agree with you, that drop-off in, in apprenticeships is, um, was definitely a problem. And I think the government is doing more and companies are doing more. But there's a lot of talk now about how uh, the apprenticeships aren't, uh, they're not all aligned. They're all working to different end goals. And uh, I think the government needs to get, or, or the government needs to uh, get a handle on this and, and form some sort of, there was a, a talk recently about a, a UCAS governing body almost to, to sort of standardize that. The government, I think, is also, I mean, they're working hard to, to create the apprenticeships, um, but there's, there's no way they can fulfill the quota, I, I don't think, in the timescales they're looking. Does um, Morgan Sindel have any apprenticeship policies? We do, there? yeah, and I'm in a joint venture with uh, Bam Nuttall and uh, Balfour Beatty, and they've all, all, all got them. Um, we're part of the Tideway project, and they're, uh, they're, they're a big advocate for um, engineering apprentices. Uh, we, we've got to have... Uh, the client has set as a goal of, I can't remember if it's one in 25 or one in 50 uh, people working on site has to be an apprentice. Uh, and you can see that already in, in our offices. There's quite a few of the big, like the big projects. Crossrail was another one where the big driver was the apprenticeship program and they wanted all the, the tier one contractors they engaged with to take on a certain number of apprenticeships. And in terms of the apprentices that say you've taken on in the last couple of years, does that 
does the is, is there much diversity there or does that still reflect some of the, the issues that we, you spoke about earlier on? I suppose I'm quite biased in a way that we, because I've come off one of these mega projects, I've gone from one mega project to another. I was on Lee Tunnel and I'm now on Tideway. And uh, they always set very high goals for things like apprenticeships, diversity. Um, I walked in a, a, a meeting room the other day. Uh, there was like a lunch and learn session. Uh, I, it was 90% 90, 90 women, um, which was it, it was, it felt very odd, you know? It was great, it was really great, but it was unusual. Um, and I, I think that's really good to see, but one, one project doing that isn't enough. The, the mega projects of the world doing that isn't enough. More, more needs to be done. You started by talking about uh, maths and physics and, and the focus on those or the need for those in, in uh, the engineering side of the construction industry, certainly. Um, do you think the, the financial and service industries are a bigger draw to people? Is that part of the reason for... Um, younger, the younger generation not being drawn into engineering? Is there a bigger return? Is there a bigger reward elsewhere? I don't know. I think if you maybe look at pure financials, it might be a draw. But then like Chris was saying, if you talk to most people our age, your driving force is, is finding a career that has some kind of substance to it. You want to know that what you're doing is making a significant difference. And I think that's where our industry over, say, financial sectors could make a real contribution. Like, you are working on some of, like, the next generation's biggest problems, and it's just a more personally fulfilling career than, an, I think, you could say for financial services. Plus, I always think about financial services. If you look at, they get paid a lot of money, but per hour, I'm not sure it's, it's worth it. I, I, I mean, I, I do think this is a problem. I and mean, one, of, one, of uh, one of the things we've looked at is um, we've, we've looked at a full range of, uh, of ages and where the problems lie. And uh, we created a model there to, to show that we need so many um, students in, in maths and physics and so many in civil engineering and then so many graduates per year to meet the quota and and one of the things we found is that there's 40 percent of uh, civil engineering graduates are not going into civil engineering now me personally i've i know people that have gone into finance and they've come out with wow 30 30 30 percent more than me as a starting wage which if you're coming out of university with these huge fees you, you're walking straight into you, you're looking for you know you're looking to start repaying them finances is, is uh you know it looks much more appealing but then like sadly was saying i think from if i think it's up to us now is to to sell the sort of challenges that we help to address i i i, I think there's not many people fully understand what civil engineers do um, or, or how broad the spectrum of jobs are uh, from BIM to design to working on site to asset management and it's, it's, about, uh, it's about us promoting that. There's the, the very theoretical, the very science-based element to engineering. We can see that, you've spoken about that, the maths of physics. But what about the, the more practical aspect? So you just mentioned design, the design technology at schools, um, ever-decreasing um, area of focus it would seem in the UK and that practical element how important is that and how is how how significant is the decline um, in government investment in that area in our schools going to further impact um, uh, the engineering profession that's I think Chris touched on it already this idea that the profession has so many different types of engineers that I don't think anyone could really say oh, well, it's, it's not for me because there's almost everything you can imagine. If you are a very mathematically technical person, there is that kind of complex modeling career. If you are a very practical, practical person, there is kind of the dealing with all the problems on site and that kind of thing. Then there's also like 3D modeling and that sort of space. And I think one of the other things I forgot to mention in the last part of that question was that it is a very, well, it's not, it's quite a flexible career in that if you wanted to work in your local community where you grow up, you can go find a local job. If you wanted to move down to London and work in the city, you can find that job. If you wanted to move halfway across the world, you can find that job. And also, there is a little bit of lifestyle choice to it as well. If you wanted to, to do things outside of your job, it, it facilitates that. It's one of these careers where you choose the right type of job for you, if that makes sense sense. So I don't think there is a kind of engineering job profile. All it kind of takes, it takes quite a creative person 
a problem solver, but there's lots of different types of creative problem solvers. And, and just building on that problem solving, I mean, yeah, I, I, I agree there is, uh, there's, there's engineers are, uh, will, should, I believe, always have some sort of, uh, not always, a maths understanding. They have that, that fundamental knowledge of, of how, how things work. But the, the people are getting to grips now that it's, it's not just about the maths and the science, it's about understanding what, the, what people need. It's, it's building solutions around people, uh, the planet, and, and what is the best end goal. And this is reflected in some of the uh, university um, entry requirements recently. Uh, I, I was on a university website, I won't mention which one, and, and they don't have a requirement for maths or any sort of sciences. It was purely a number of UCAS points and A star through to, to A as, as three, three modules. So I, th I think they're understanding that there's a, there's a broader range of, of uh, people that can get involved in civil engineering, and it's, it's not just about designing a beam and designing a building. There is a, there's a deep thing. But again, I think it's up to, it's up to us to, to tackle that a younger age to make people aware that this is a really interesting career. It's really diverse, but it's, and it's it's not all maths. Although if you're good at it, you'll excel at it as well. Um, I started out as an apprentice, and I got out of school four years ago. And I think it is worth mentioning that it isn't advertised anywhere near as much as uh, the financial sector and business and everything. So, what do you think you guys can do? to communicate to people at school and college that the construction and civil engineering world is lucrative to get involved with? So that's one of the things we're trying to look at, how to better engage with teachers. I think teachers are often responsible for giving that career advice, and if they don't know that opportunity is there, like, for example, I think the institution itself has various different scholarships. So in addition to getting your apprenticeship, you stand the chance of getting, earning even more money through scholarships. And, and that kind of stuff was never, that was never advertised at school. The only reason I knew was I did a bit of work experience and someone said, oh, you're a bright girl, why don't you, why don't you apply for, for a scholarship in addition to that? And, and yeah, I think that there's a few different programs. There's some kind of programs where teachers do work experience is one thing, where they try and get, companies try and get teachers to go on a few days of work experience, so then they can better explain what's happening. Because I, I think it is very hard for, Teachers do have a tough position because if they don't actually have any concept of what an engineer does, they have no real way of selling it. Um, so I think that's one thing to do. The other one is it's, there's STEMnet and things like that. So I don't know if your school ever had anyone come in. but So STEMnet is uh, science, technology, technology engineering, engineering, and maths. maths. And it's a kind of network of, of volunteer ambassadors. So the idea is that you as a STEMnet volunteer go into school and you either talk about your career or you run a practical activity or you just, just tell people that this career is an option. Um, and that's quite a good network. But I do think that we need to get more civil engineers, construction professionals involved on that. Again, some of the big projects, they have outreach. So I remember when I was working on Crossrail, our local site had, uh, had a, a project with a school just down the road um, and that kind of thing. But, yeah, like Chris said, this shouldn't be the problem for just the institution and the big projects. It should be each individual person realizing that, hey, if I talk to one person, then maybe that might influence if I go and talk in a school. And just as an example, I spent one hour of my day at a school um, because my friend's a teacher and she had a careers fair and she said, can you come and talk to school kids for an hour? And I thought, okay. So I went down to her school and um, she gave me a call a few weeks later and she said, I was talking to people about what they wanted to do as a career. And this little lad said he wanted to be a civil engineer. And she said, where did you, where did that come from? She said, well, this person came in to talk at school. Like, it's just an hour of my time. And that's all it took. So I just think everyone needs to make their own individual contribution. I just ask you, actually, I mean, how did you get into, what, what was your apprenticeship in? Uh, it's construction management. OK, and how did you get into that? My mum told me about it. <laughs> See, this, this, is, this is the age-old story. I mean, uh, Sathi's uncle was... Uh, well, my dad's a civil engineer. Dad's a civil engineer. Uh, uncle's a mechanical engineer. My uncle, my cousin are both civil engineers. Uh, my dad works in construction finance. And it's, it's, it's this line, like, civil engineers, construction professionals are coming from, from this line of their parents <laughs> told dynasty. them. But, but the, the, it's almost like the rest of the population isn't, isn't fully the, aware they exist. And even when my dad told me about it, I thought it sounded really boring. <laughs> so it's, it's, about, it's about us selling, selling what, what's, what's available, you know. Against, we're, we're competing against the, the other engineering uh, disciplines. Are, 
for lack of a better word, winning. Uh, mechanical engineering, uh, they're, they've, they've continued to take on um, uh, more, more entries, uh, they've continued to more entries and, and we've, we've dropped off. Uh, it's, it's what we're not doing now, we've, we're trying to understand and, and this is where we built up the model of uh, how many students we need to get involved at every stage and, and now we're, we're looking and saying we, we need to broaden, broaden our horizons, we need to make sure that we're not, we're not closing the gaps to women, to uh, ethnic minorities and the likes. And, um, through, through it all, I mean, we're, we're one part, small part of the ICE. The ICE uh, continues to work with government and uh, uh, to, to inform the government about new policies and, and where the skills gaps are. But um, we, we need more people to do more. Um, we we yeah. take part in STEMnet, but it's us alone is not enough, you know. And I'm tired of people who I, I regularly get the, but you don't look like an engineer quest, like, question, and I'm just tired of hearing that. <laughs> I think it is worth mentioning that uh, the contractors that we got on our site, we um, ensured that they signed up to a charter uh, to take on X amount of uh, apprentices and X amount of graduates. Um, and the guy that was sitting next to me is part of our civil engineering uh, sort of framework. And he start, started out as an 18 year old himself. And uh, I'm sure he'll uh, back me up on this, but I'm actually loving my life now instead of just being a student. So it's a great path to be part of. And, I couldn't express that enough. Yeah, and if you look at the top end of construction firms, at directors and things, they're a mixture. They're apprentices. They oh. were graduates. They're all a mixture of people. There's no real, this is the best route in. This will get you the furthest up the ladder. There's yeah, totally agree. Uh, do you think international students can help to meet this skills shortage? Because nowadays there's so much issues about visas and everything. When international students get graduated, there's no support from the government. But you can see there is so much demand in the industry. Mm -hmm. So what do you think uh, government should do regarding that? It is, it is quite a difficult question, especially in this country where immigration is tightening up and tightening up. We do have a skills shortage. And there is some responsibility in encouraging people to fill those jobs. But um, I, yes, in short, I do think there is a role to play for international students. Um, I also think that would help add to the diversity mix in that we as civil engineers, all of the kind of major UK players, they work internationally. And to work internationally, you do have to have some experience in working in an international group. So I do think that actually having quite a few international students amongst the mix is a good, it's definitely a good thing. Um, how you, you kind of sh demonstrate that, I'm not 100% sure. A lot of my friends who have done like civil engineering, and uh, they have to leave the country because of the visa rules and everything. Yeah. They had got the, all the perfect skills, they had master's degrees and everything. So there were like a limited opportunities when it comes down from the government. So that's where I think government should help to focus this sector as a skill shortage sector, mm -hmm. rather than like only focusing on like some other sectors like tech sector, where there is a lot of shortage of people. I think construction should be also given as a skill shortage sector status then only it will attract a lot of attention or else it will slowly, slowly disappear kind of thing. Yeah, we definitely have a skill shortage. The other interesting thing I always think about international views on engineering is, so when I used to live in Spain, it was interesting, one, because the gender mix was 50-50, and also people seem very proud of being a civil, like civil engineering is a very well-recognized degree, and people seem to want to do that as much as, say, medicine and all these other things, whereas in the UK, that perception isn't there like and also I think yeah so my family come from Sri Lanka and the same thing there engineering is a very highly regarded career and I think there is something to learn from other countries about how it is a very well respected career um, yeah what do you think the eco build could do to uh, promote this better or to get the message out uh, in order to, to, to help you with the message that you're trying to deliver one of the things we were just discussing before we stood up here was the idea that, although it's quite nice to talk to all of you, you're, we're kind of preaching to the converted. If you're here, you kind of understand that there's something worth thinking about and that there's a, it's worth having a conversation. No, yeah, exactly that. I mean, if you've already come down here, you've, if, you're, if you're sat in this area, you already care about what, what, what we're talking about. So 
again, this is um, may maybe it's something we need uh, more diverse people down here. Maybe it's the case that the videos are used to uh, to, to help inform others. I mean, this is all the way from teachers through to uh, politicians to parents, and, and, and this is part of what we've been working on is, is outreach. Yeah, I guess maybe just a bit more material scattered throughout. So do you think uh, the exhibition should target um, more students and uh, school groups to an exhibition like this? To I, I, like? Don't know, I don't know if a young schools group would be interested in walking around and... and I don't know, I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> I reckon, I reckon if you put young people together with professionals, because professionals are quite funny because they kind of like, they moan about the jobs between each other, but when you start talking to, about their little interest, they get so excited and I think that that kind of enthusiasm and like showing them the kind of bits, especially something like this where it's quite interactive and you could actually make a few more toys and a few more activities, but I do think that kids mixing in would definitely add to the exhibition. I could, I could go for that. <laughs> <laughs>